focusing mostly on diabetic eye disease. Um, next up will be Dr. Chirag Javeri. Chirag is very involved in the DRCR network and is one of the principal members of that. And I'm proud to say that his he'll be presenting the work on a protocol AC, that's a flibrocep monotherapy or bevacizumab uh, first for diabetic macular edema. And he was first author in the New England Journal article that just came out on this topic. Chirag, welcome. Chirag, if you could please unmute oh. your microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope everybody can see uh, the screen. Uh, so I'm uh, honored to present. Thank you for inviting me to talk uh, today. And we're uh, proud on behalf of all the other co-authors and all the members of the uh, DRC or RETNET network. I'm going to present to you the results of uh, protocol AC or, or a flibrocept monotherapy uh, or bevacizumab first for diabetic macular edema. Uh, so we, uh, these are my financial disclosures. Uh, so we know that based on protocol T, patients who received a flibrocept uh, compared to ranibizumab and bevacizumab did better in the first year if they had 20-50 vision or worse uh, due to diabetic macular edema. At two years, the flibrocept group maintained that superiority compared to bevacizumab. Um, however, the patients who uh, were um, the patients who were treated, excuse me, the patients who were treated with bevacizumab still did quite well, and therefore uh, we wanted to see if uh, starting with bevacizumab uh, first and then switching to a flibrocept would uh, create equivalent results. The reason for this is because, particularly in the United States, uh, we're often required to start with certain medications like bevacizumab uh, due to insurance purposes. Obviously, the reason being is because there's a very significant price difference in the United States, as well as in most other countries between bevacizumab and aflibercept. However, these decisions that are being put forth by policymakers um, are done purely for financial reasons, and we did not know if this was potentially harming the patients or if this was a viable strategy. Uh, so protocol AC was designed to help answer that. Uh, patients were randomized into either a flibrocept monotherapy or bevacizumab first, with the opportunity to switch to a flibrocept in certain cases if they met certain switch criteria. The inclusion criteria was very similar to protocol T, and I won't bore over that, but the only exception was that this was looking at only patients with 2050 vision or worse. Primary outcome was the mean change in vision uh, over two years or area under the curve. The follow-up schedule was also very similar to protocol T. However, at 12 weeks, patients had the opportunity in the bevacizumab first group to switch if they met the certain switch criteria. So for the first three months, we didn't people did not get to switch. Only after three months, if they were not responding as well, did they switch. Uh, patients were given uh, monthly injections and then were extended out. Um, and so what was the switch criteria? Well, first, patients had to have persistent edema on OCT and on exam. Uh, patients had to still be given bevacizumab uh, the last two visits. So if a patient had done very well and was 2020 and no edema was there and they were, uh, they were extended out and then injections were deferred, if they had blew it again, they weren't switched automatically. They were restarted on bevacizumab. So they had to be continually treated with bevacizumab. Also, for the last two visits, patients had to have uh, no improvement of five letters in the last two visits, or no more than improvement of five letters, or no more than 10% uh, of uh, improvement of the la on their CST for the last two visits. So not much vision improvement and not much thickness improvement. And then lastly, their pa the patient's vision still had to be compromised. So at 12 to 24 weeks, so within the first three months of the opportunity to switch, they had to have 20, 50 vision or worse. So in essence, they likely didn't really improve much. They didn't cross that 20, 50 threshold. However, after 24 weeks, patients could still be switched if they had 20, 32 vision. So these are the patients that maybe they did improve a little bit. They did cross that 20, 50, uh, cr cross that 20, 50 threshold. So initially, they did not meet switching criteria. 
but maybe they were plateaued off and our thoughts were, is there an opportunity for these patients to improve um, a little bit more uh, uh, if we switch them to a flibercept? If they met the switch criteria, they were given at least two aflibercept injections. And then after that, they then uh, follow the same retreatment criteria for protocol T, i.e. if they could, if they improved and their edema resolved um, and they were found stable, they would then uh, be extended out and then deferred injections. So the number of participants were relatively equivalent in the two groups and the completion of the two year visits were also uh, similar uh, and uh, uh, into in both groups. The baseline characteristics between the two groups were similar as well. Uh, the ocular baseline characteristics were similar with respect to vision, OCT thickness and uh, previous anti-VEGF treatment. So what were the results? So first, the number of injections between the two groups varied by about 1.5, with the bevacizumab group needing one and a half more injections on average over two years. Um, if you look, the majority of the injections in the bevacizumab group were bevacizumab, excuse me, the bevacizumab first group. Uh, about seven, almost seven uh, of the injections out of the 16 were the aflibercept injections. That is, of course, half compared to the aflibercept monotherapy only. What was, how many patients met switch criteria and were switched over? So over two years, surprisingly, 70% of patients met switch criteria over the two years. More than half of them met that criteria within the first three months of them having the opportunity to switch. About 57% who would have switched over the two years switched within those first three months. So it seems like many of the patients, if they were not going to be responding well to bevacizumab, didn't respond early on. In terms of visual outcome and our primary outcome, which was, of course, area over uh, area under the curve over two years, the two groups did not have any difference uh, over two years. You can see that the aflibercept monotherapy has uh, is a little bit more favorable within the first year. And this is something that we would have actually expected based on looking at protocol T results. Secondary outcomes, patients uh, who had 20-20 vision or better were similar between the two groups as well as 20-40 vision or better. Very few patients had very poor vision uh, um, at two years in either group. The number of lines that were improved within the two groups were also very similar with respect to three and two line gainers. Two line and three line loss was also very low, low and also similar between the two groups. Patients with respect to CST improvement at two years was also no difference. However, once again, you can see that the aflibercept monotherapy group is, does, is favored slightly within that first year, but then catches up, the bevacizumab at first group catches up in the second year. The number of patients that had complete DME resolution at two years was also similar when in both groups. So in terms of adverse events, uh, ocular adverse events were similar uh, with no uh, major difference. In terms of APTC events, also uh, no major uh, uh, difference. However, when we look at other systemic adverse events, there was a statistical difference between hospitalization rates, serious adverse events overall reported, as well as hypertension. However, we do not feel that this is necessarily something indicative of flibercept monotherapy, partially because many of the other studies that have been well documented, they did, have not found any major differences between the anti-VEGF, uh, the, the different anti-VEGFs, as well as it's hard to really say if, if the bevacizumab first group was specifically bevacizumab related because 70% of the patients in the bevacizumab first group also received a flibercept. So in summary, 70% of eyes in the bevacizumab group were switched to flibercept during the two years. More than half of these eyes were switched between weeks 12 and 24. There was no overall difference in the mean change in vision over a two-year period, whether administering a flibercept monotherapy or giving bevacizumab first and switching to a flibercept based on pre-specified criteria. There's no difference in retinal thickness between the 
groups at two years as well. So rescue treatment with the Flibercept mitigated the average visual and anatomic differences that we found in protocol T between a Flibercept monotherapy and bevacizumab monotherapy. So results from this study, of course, can only be really generalized if you follow the switch criteria and the retreatment criteria. If there's another criteria that's used, it may be this specific result may not be applicable. Um, how, having said that, starting with the Flibercept, excuse me, starting with bevacizumab will have significant cost reduction uh, impacts uh, compared to just starting with a Flibercept in patients who have 2050 vision or worse. So in this trial, no significant difference was found um, and initiating therapy with bevacizumab is a reasonable and safe and effective alternative to a flibercept monotherapy. Uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, please. Uh,